Well, welcome back to the course, African Political Thought. Today we're going to continue our theme of trauma, which we introduced last week by discussing the work of some of the continent's great writers, particularly the great novelists. This has also been reflected in the work of the great poets, Jack Mapanje, of Malawi being a case in point. But I want to take up the theme of trauma as expressed by great novelists and then lead on to some treatments of the condition of trauma. And of course, the novel I referenced in particular last week was by the Zimbabwean writer, the late Yvonne Vera, and particularly her book, The Stone Virgins. That was the last book that she published before her untimely death. There is a posthumous manuscript in circulation. I'm not really sure what's happening with that. I've seen that, but it does need some substantial rewriting or completion. And whether or not it would truly express her views and what she was trying to write about is an open question. But even so, I think The Stoned Virgins is a complete work which expresses a writer at the height of her powers. And as I said, it's a novel about trauma, trauma caused by having to commit atrocities during the War of Liberation. This, as you can understand, is not a welcome topic in post-liberation Zimbabwe. After all, liberation was meant to have been something heroic. The fact that it created trauma not only in the victims of war, often innocent victims of war, but also committed atrocities in the minds of the people who were called upon to fight, to kill, to execute others. The trauma within by those who were liberators is the theme of Yvonne Vera's book. And very, very much she embeds a number of themes here, not only to do with post-traumatic stress syndrome, but expressed very, very much in a traditional context. The book's title, The Stone Virgins, is named after the cave in which the renegade traumatized former fighter lives before he emerges at nighttime to commit atrocities against women, raping, disfiguring, killing them. And it's about this cave. There are cave paintings, primeval cave paintings, painted on stone of women, therefore the stone virgins. What the spirits of the cave were calling out for him to do is another one of these open questions, particularly as there was this huge trope in Mugabe's Zimbabwe about the sacred nature of the land. Well, is the land sacred only because it's inhabited by beneficent spirits? Or can it also have habitation by malevolent spirits? What happens to the spirit world in a time of national trauma, which accompanies a time of struggle for national liberation? So the whole idea of trauma is embedded in a national context, in a cultural context, in the work of Yvonne Vera. Now, this is what makes it a multi-dimensional novel that I think very few people actually appreciate. The complexity and the overlays and underlays and their intersections are basically constituents of a masterpiece. But the idea of trauma doesn't go away simply when you close the last page of a complex novel. It's there very, very much as a condition. Post-traumatic stress syndrome means what it says. It takes a long time to get over it, particularly if you've had to do terrible things. And if the entire nation has emerged from basically a reign of terror, then it takes all kinds of institutional devices to overcome at least the superficial memory of that terror, to be able to live at least superficially with the legacies of terror and those who committed terror, who have to live alongside those who suffered terror. 
So you have post-independence devices like in South Africa, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where the public testimonies of those who were often atrocious, committing racist crimes, but basically sometimes committing crimes outright, murder, pillage, and rapine, all of these things, confessing these things in public as an act of penance, as an act of desire to accommodate oneself to the new South Africa, often very sincere confessions, sometimes perhaps opportunistic ones, but all the same taken, certainly at the time, as a major collective therapy for the nation, a key and essential part of the Rainbow Bridge that Mandela was trying to build, and imbued with the Christian ethos of forgiveness as enunciated by people like Archbishop Desmond Tutu, very, very much as devices to deal with trauma, not to eradicate trauma, but to allow it to be sufficiently submerged so that the Rainbow Bridge could be built on top of it, and people could then walk across. Now, this is problematic, of course, is this going to be sufficient foundation for a long-lasting rainbow bridge? Or are the stirrings of new forms of racism in South Africa today some kind of evidence that the foundations for the rainbow bridge were never completely secure in the first instance? It did its job. Maybe it was a temporary job. Maybe something new is required because you can't suppress an entire people, the majority of your country, for so many decades and expect no consequences. Similarly, in Rwanda, after the terrible genocide, what was established there, the Kachacha courts, and my colleague Dr. Phil Clark has written very, very eloquently about these, these are village level mechanisms whereby the entire village is convened to discuss and to hear the confessions of those who took part in the genocide. So they are there amidst people against whom they committed or attempted to commit genocide. And the entire apparatus, the Kachacha courts, is not to seek retribution but to seek accommodation, some kind of way forward by which the community can embrace those who committed atrocities against the community. In many ways, it's a terrifyingly bold movement. It has a long and controversial history. One of the controversies about it is, is to what extent is it used by the government as a control device? Remember the past in a way that makes you fearful of a future without the current government that basically occasioned the liberation from the genocide. It's a case of forgiving the government as excesses, perhaps, as much as forgiving the perpetrators of the genocide. All the same, it's kept Rwanda in some sense of stability. There's tension underneath the surface. These problems haven't gone away. Many of the militias who committed the genocide escaped to neighboring countries, to parts of Democratic Republic of Congo, for instance, and low-scale but continuing peripheral warfare has been part of the experience of post-genocide Rwanda. In other words, evidence of that trauma is there. The militarized preparedness on the borders is evidence of that. The lack of surrender on the part of the rebel groups is evidence of that. The need to have prolonged the Kachacha courts for such a long period of time, only now being wound down, is again evidence of that. So mechanisms for dealing with trauma beg all kinds of questions. How successful, obviously, is the key question. 
how deep, how deeply does the mechanism work is another key question. And of course, a very great deal of this was essentially foretold, was it not, uh, by people like Franz Fanon. Now, I want to put Fanon into some kind of context. He's regarded as the great apostle of the need for violence. But I want to put him in the context of his own life history. He came from Martinique. This is a French colonial possession in the Caribbean. He was part of an educated elite in Martinique. It also gave rise to people like Aimé Césaire. Both Césaire and Fanon went to France and people like Césaire made common cause with people like Senghor from Senegal. Basically, the moment of victory was a rendezvous of victory in which the culture and the intellects of the black people were finally established as being completely equal with those of the white people. And this resonates in Fanon's work as well, the sense of a desire for equality. When you look at his book, Black Skin, White Masks, basically the end goal is equality. And he asks the questions, you know, why can't there be a black Hegel? Why can't there be a black Tchaikovsky? In other words, the idea was to rise up from denigration and trauma caused by that denigration. But the idea of being able to go forward depended on a co-equal foundation for going forward. All the same, what to do about trauma? Now, in fact, did Black Skin White Masks Fanon try to deal with this issue? It was originally the first draft of his doctoral thesis, but quite clearly a book like that was never going to be accepted as an academic thesis. In the end, he submitted something more traditionally academic. But that became one of his two most famous books. It's well to remember that he wrote a great number of books as well as academic papers. The academic papers were about psychiatric topics, and in some cases, socio-anthropological psychiatric subjects and topics. He was, after all, a psychiatrist. His PhD was in psychiatry. He had a medical degree, and he was very learned in French. Unlike Ngugi, although he recognized the possible perfidities of speaking the language of the oppressors, he could not return to a Kikuyu language because his language in Martinique was a form of Creole, a combination of what was left of native quote-unquote speech and French. How authentic is the hybrid? So questions are begged there. But being able to speak French fluently, write it fluently, meant that he had access to a French audience and through that to a metropolitan audience. He wrote many books, as I said, many of them on French politics. He was deeply imbued in the conduct of French politics. Uh, the names of French prime ministers, people we can't even remember now, uh, people like Debray, for instance, resonate throughout his essays, his books on French politics. But his most famous book by far came out in 1961 as he was dying. The Wretched of the Earth in French, Les Damnes de la Terre, uh, was really the book that introduced him to a global audience, uh, which is still in some ways regarded as a Bible for liberation today, even though very few people seem to have read it. Uh, people who have read it seem to have fixated on the themes introduced by Jean-Paul Sartre's very lengthy preface, which in some ways understands and captures the book very well, and in other ways does it a disservice. Because Sartre uses prevailing metaphorical imagery, the oppressed native hiding in the bushes, his coiled muscles ready to explode in anger and his denigration, as if anger was the reservation of the native, as Sartre called them, and to the native alone was denied the condition of philosophy. But if you read Wretched of the Earth, it's a philosophical and a psychiatric book. 
in psychiatric terms, heavily influenced by Jacques Lacan, uh, the French neo-Freudian psychoanalytic thinker. The whole idea of overcoming trauma and overcoming the impersonation of being well, in other words, going deep, that is something which one could accuse both the Kachacha courts in Rwanda, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, of lacking of lacking that Lacanian depth to go to the subterranean nature of trauma, the causes of trauma, and the mechanisms by which we seek to escape trauma in one way or another, superficially or otherwise, how deeply you have to go and how deeply a nation can go are other questions entirely. But in the wretched of the earth, what you have are a collection of case studies, psychiatric case studies. They could have been published in slightly rewritten form as medical papers, as scientific papers, about the effects of trauma on those who had been persecuted, tortured, basically mistreated by the French colonial authorities in Algeria. Because, of course, Fanon took up the Algerian cause. He had met Algerians when he was working as a doctor in Marseille. He understood their condition. He took it to be representative of a certain condition caused by a militant and then militarized French colonialism. Wrote about the trauma very persuasively as a reason why liberation was important. But liberation was important not just in its political context to achieve political goals. It was important also in a psychological context to achieve the truly liberated person who could then become an equal person to those who had previously oppressed them. So the book is deeply complex and works at many levels. Basically, the popularization of the book particularly in the work of the Black Panthers in America, for instance. And this is a group of radical, largely young men, but some women, who were affronted by racism in the United States. They thought that the efforts of the civil rights movement, led by people like Martin Luther King, was too ready to be accommodating of white power, and indeed, you could say that this was a genuinely based critique. How many compromises do you have to make anyway? All the same, Martin Luther King got himself shot for trying to do that, to take, as it were, almost a revolution in US terms for genuine equality, but wanting to take that forward step by step. And he inspired a lot of people. When we were choosing the cover for my next book, which is to some extent based on this course, one of the photographs that we flirted with was a wonderful portrait, I thought, of Kenneth Kaunda sitting next to Martin Luther King, and the two are obviously sharing notes. In other words, the influence of King beyond the United States is something which needs to be reckoned with. But the influence of someone like Fanon beyond France, beyond Algeria, in the United States, is again something to be reckoned with. Now, Fanon began having his posthumous image reworked in the United States. Uh, in other words, what you have is the transformation of Fanon into an African liberator. Now, although Algeria, of course, is in northern Africa, and although the struggle against French colonialism was certainly savage there, what you also had was Fanon, who was made a roving ambassador for the Algerian Liberation Front. And as such, he was able to visit places like Accra in Ghana for the first time. In other words, Fanon was not deeply familiar with sub-Saharan Africa. He was not even very deeply familiar with Algeria. After his death, his body was smuggled into Algeria, so he could be buried with military honours by the Liberation Front. 
so he could be buried in the country which he had championed in terms of its desire for freedom and its desire for equality. But what Fanon was writing about was a universal condition which was exacerbated because of being black and being traumatized because of being denied equality. The Panthers therefore took it, said that this was authentically African, said that this was African in terms of speaking to black people universally, said that the black diaspora was part of Africa, and particularly when you have books that were written in prison in 1965 by people like Eldridge Cleaver, Soul on Ice, that came out in 1968, hugely influential, coming out at just the time of the events of 1968, the youth and the student uprisings throughout the world at that point in time, not just in Paris. Uh, Paris ignited an international movement of student protest which perhaps we might be about to see the beginnings of again, but in a different way to that of 1968. But the generation of 1968, rather than reading Fanon in the first instance, would read people like Aldrich Cleaver. Now, these were like bite-sized pieces riffing off Fanon's work, The Wretched of the Earth. But people like Cleaver didn't understand Africa at all, even though they professed that they were part of an African experience of being denigrated. So when afterwards he took exile in Algiers, Algeria was now independent of the French, it was regarded as the capital of freedom, of what we then called third world freedom. And it was very, very clear that Cleaver and those Panthers that who came with him, by that stage the Black Panther movement had split along what seems to be a myriad of lines, Cleaver didn't understand Algeria at all, despite its still heavy French overlays. He didn't understand French culture either, and basically set up something of a communal outpost of America, Black America, which never ever was able to integrate with Algeria or with Africa as a whole. Others who went to Africa married into African as it were, cultural royalty, uh, they perhaps did a better job of it than Cleaver. But by that stage, as I said, the Black Panther movement had fragmented, but not without leaving trace around the world. So that in New Zealand, in the wake of Soul on Ice by Aldridge Cleaver, I think I've said to you the beginnings of a group that emulated the style of the Panthers in New Zealand, Anatamatoa, the young warriors, uh, that was very, very basically an emulation stylistically, but also an emulation of the felt need for a more militant approach to the whole question of equality and liberation. And this kind of thing was probably repeated around the world. So what you've got is a genealogy where Fanon becomes reinvented over time in different countries, and he's invented in the first instance as an apostle, particularly of African liberation. Now, if this only affected people like the Black Panthers, who found it very, very difficult to integrate, as it were, with their hosts, who treated them very well in Algiers, it also had an effect on people in Black Africa, who had been suffering oppression because of institutional discrimination, particularly in South Africa with its institutional system of apartheid. So if you were to say, by whom was the young Steve Biko in South Africa influenced? You're going to have to say that he was indeed influenced by both Fanon and the Black Panthers. He claimed to have been influenced by Fanon, but whether or not it was the bite-sized rendition of Fanon by the Panthers, that's an open question. Uh, one of the problems, of course, about the legacy of Biko is that he died too young. He was basically assassinated, beaten to death, probably deliberately, by the apartheid South African police. So he did not leave a legacy of writing. In other words, although there are essays and speeches, then you have no, as it were, 
body of work of a substantial nature by which you can interrogate the nature of his thinking. He certainly left a legacy in terms of inspiration so that the students in South Africa today who are engaged in things like Fees Must Fall, Zuma Must Fall, uh, all of these kinds of things hark back by name to Biko. In other words, a black consciousness movement, speaking perhaps to new forms of separation, speaking perhaps to the failure of the drive for equality so that one seeks to go beyond and to ensure that one is never again put into a period of space of inferiority. All of these are problematic aspects of the South African experience today, complicated, not easily understood by the outside world, but dynamic all the same, and riffing off, as Cleaver riffed off Fanon, riffing off Biko. But as I say, Biko left no great legacy of work, and there are ironies in all of this. Irony in the case of Fanon, he wrote about trauma, and the South African apartheid government looked at this and said, okay, we're going to use this as part of our arsenal of tools. If this is the effect of trauma, we can cause this. And what you heard was the employment of exactly what they had learned from Fanon in terms of terrorizing the local black population, but also in the 1980s when apartheid entered its last decade and was determined to go down fighting and taking the fight to all of the surrounding states and was military destabilization of all of the black majority rules, uh, all the black majority ruled states in the region differently state by state according to the capacity of each state because the last thing the South Africans wanted is to have to rule conquered states. That would have been far too problematic. They were having enough trouble trying to rule South Africa, let alone a whole bunch of black states. So the idea was to cause terror, to cause fear. And in those countries where they used a light touch militarily, and despite all kinds of commando and air force raids, Zambia was lightly touched militarily. But the idea was to cause psychological distress, fear, trauma, in terms of the expectation of military punishment for supporting the ANC. These were lessons which were digested by the South Africans and incorporated into what they called total strategy. In other words, everything went into the arsenal. Different bits of the arsenal were differently deployed in different countries with their different contexts. The idea was all the same, to induce a condition of trauma. So what you had there was a certain learning process. In the case of Biko, the learning process was also ironic because what he did, being dissatisfied with the multiracial South African student organization, he established his own, which was non-white. By non-white, he meant non-white. You didn't have to be black. In other words, anyone who is not white, and by virtue of their being discriminated against, because everyone who was not white was indeed discriminated against, Asians, colored people, Chinese people, they were all welcome into his new student organization. And the South African apartheid government actually at first welcomed Biko's new student organization, because they thought, oh goody, these people want to be part of apartheid. They want to be separate, don't they? And what might have happened if the South Africans had made their outreach in a more sophisticated way is another question entirely. In the end, that particular flirtatious approach to Biko's student organization fell away. And as Biko began having more influence, particularly among black students, he became a target. One of the ironies, of course, of South African history is that the young reporter who basically discovered that his death had been caused by probably deliberate police beating, in other words, as I called it, an assassination, it was Helen Zeller, who later on went on to become the leader of the Democratic Alliance 
and fell from grace as a member of the Democratic Alliance just a few short years ago by speaking in what seemed to be an unrepentant tone about the virtues and the benefits brought by white rule. And of course, some benefits were brought, but all kinds of lack of benefit, denial of benefit, and all kinds of denigration. These were also brought into the South African context by white rule. So on the balance of things, what you have is a balance towards trauma. Although Helen Zila revealed that this had probably been an assassination and her career was ruined as a result of that, as she took the side of the black resistors, often using her house as a safe passage house so that people could escape from police custody, escape as part of a safe network to places like Zambia, for instance. What you had all the same was an expression of the contradiction of South African history in which trauma basically plays out in different ways so that even a liberal white person is traumatized by the loss of white privilege even though they try to help black equality. Everything becomes such a complex matrix that one is looking at a condition of confusion. And that's why the South African Constitution, when it was finally released, is a model effort to try to do something about this. Now, let me immediately put this into context. If the Constitution was meant to be a triumph, why was there a need for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was essentially extra-constitutional, that is, outside of the Constitution, and which basically defied the normal rules of jurisdiction prudential approaches to justice, of juridical transactions of issues to do with justice. Can you have the two? And this is one of the contradictions of the new South Africa. So even though the new constitution was immediately almost impeded or second-guessed by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, what you had all the same as a model constitution there's nothing else like it in the world. The range of equalities is magnificent. I'm not content with the obvious equality between black and white and all other racial groups. You would expect that of a post-apartheid constitution. You have expressly embedded in the constitution gender equality. You have sexual preference equality. In other words, gay marriage, gay relationships, lesbian relationships, all of these things are very, very much constitutionally part of your suite of freedoms. And in this range of equalities and in the guarantee of juridical independence, you have, as I say, something which stands as a marker in the constitutional development of the world. Other constitutions internationally, however, and certainly in Africa, have had to come through difficult processes of violence and dislocation. So you have countries with successive constitutions, like in Nigeria. There has to be constitutional rule after every single military government. So do you just bring forward the old constitution, which had been abrogated by the military government, or do you have to introduce a new one? So all kinds of things to do with trying to recreate the state so that military rule, civil war, doesn't happen again. All of these are parts of the ongoing processes of African development. So in some ways, juridical development is every bit as important and meaningful as economic development. And the reason for this is that it's law and it's the constitution that gives the citizen, A, the idea of being a citizen with rights and with redress, and redress against the state can be through independent mechanisms like the judiciary. It gives you guarantees of your right to freely express yourself, to oppose. All of these things constitute a citizen. The citizen is constituted by provision in the Constitution. So the Constitution becomes key 
to development, becomes key to statehood, it becomes the guarantor of a proper nationalism, it becomes, as it were, that marker of a state as being proper in terms of its internal relationships. All the same, what you have is you can have the best constitution on earth, uh, but if it's not observed, then of course it becomes meaningless. And of course the key instrument in the observation of constitutions is the independent judiciary. Once intrude upon that, once put the judiciary into the hands, into the pockets of the politicians, particularly the ruling party politicians, and then you're facing all kinds of problems. And of course the misuse of law, uh, the misuse of power, was very evident in 2007 in Kenya. So what you had after very fiercely fought elections, uh, you had a result uh, which went against the opinion polls, and it went against the opinion polls that were conducted not only locally, but conducted by US groups uh, who had surveyed key parts of the country in terms of political affiliation before uh, the elections. And all the opinion polls pointed to an opposition victory, all the same, the result was announced as a government victory and ethnic riots broke out of a very bloody nature. And of course, everyone wondered about the speed of these riots and how quickly the rioters were mobilized. There was a game plan obviously in waiting. In other words, everyone knew that there was the risk of the elections being stolen or at least disputed and everyone had their strong arm people on standby in an organized fashion, either to fight or to fight back. This achieved an ethnic dimension, of course, because the two major parties, Kikuyu, Luo, as bases, as linguistic and ethnic bases, basically these things were transacted also in political terms. And so you had civil strife that seemed to have an ethnic dimension. The mobilization of ethnic organization for the sake of the triumph of political organization means that you have a phenomenon of great density. But what were they fighting for? Michaela Wrong in her book, It's Our Turn to Eat, basically sums it up. Once you're in power, you get everything. It's our turn to eat now. We eat everything. Maybe it's a bit of a caricature. It basically resonated as a very brief descriptor of what was at stake. And you get to eat everything because underneath the previous Kenyan constitution, the president had so much power. In other words, if you won the presidency, it was your passport to your turn to eat. So that the compromise achieved by Kofi Annan, who was brought in by the African Union to negotiate, it prefigured the compromise that Thabo Mbeki imposed upon Zimbabwe a year later after the stolen elections there, 2008. And in 2007, what Kofi Annan did was to forge a coalition government and the opposition leader had to be satisfied with being the prime minister. He agreed to that for the sake of peace, but it meant that the presidency remained in the hands of the incumbent. And in terms of the Michaela Wrong diagnosis, that would normally have meant it was still the turn of his people to eat. So the trick was, and this is the sting in the tail of the Kofi Annan mediation. First of all, he ensured there were a number of indictments brought against politicians on both sides uh, to appear before the International Criminal Court. So this was occasioned by an African statesman in an African context. Over the course of time, most of these indictments fell away. Perhaps they were designed to do that, but certainly at the time, they were seen as a signal that there was no such thing as impunity. The second thing that he called for, apart from the compromise and coalition government, was of course, the drafting of a new constitution. Now this did take place, so what you had was a coalition, a small coalition, of some of the best jurists, legal thinkers, from Kenya and from the region, East Africa, and also from other parts of Africa, 
Uh, this is where in this series of lectures things begin to intersect. I think I told you the story of the very beginnings of negotiations about negotiations, talks about talks to release Nelson Mandela in Lusaka in 1984, and my hosting the Track 2 delegation that came up from Pretoria to try to kickstart this process. And one member of this two-person delegation was Piet Muller, uh, who came to dine at my house as their icebreaker. And I had invited a couple of my students from the University of Zambia to be part of the company. And Piet came leaping up to me in the kitchen afterwards saying that he was amazed because that was the first time he had ever dined in black company. Well, one of these students, Jaloka Bayani, very radical young man, but a very brilliant young man, went on to take his doctorate at Oxford, is now working for the London School of Economics as a professor of law there. Uh, he was invited to be part of the process of rewriting the Kenyan constitution. And I would get reports from the field. Jaloka is very, very notorious for not writing at the best of times. If you send him an email, you might get a reply of a tour. Uh, months and months and months later, he's that tardy. Uh, but I got quite regular correspondence from the field from Jaloka because obviously it was a very, very difficult process. And so I was the unload, as it were, mechanism for him. And conducting consultations far out into the rural areas of Kenya. In other words, they didn't just sit down as a bunch of elite legal thinkers and write a new constitution. This had to be something that was meaningful to the citizens, acceptable to the citizens, because the citizens themselves were constituted by the constitution. But what you had emerging from this is not something like the South African constitution. You have a constitution that very deliberately limits the powers of the presidency. So that if you win the presidency, it's not your turn to eat everything. Now, this is an important breakthrough. I've tried to express it in popular, almost vulgar terms. I apologize for that. It's quite a complex constitution in its own right. But the idea, all the same, of one of the key foundation ingredients that one considers inputting into any good constitution is the limitation of powers. And the idea of limiting the power of the president becomes a key and important one, because if the president has unlimited power or seemingly unlimited power, what is the power of the average citizen in terms of seeking redress against this almighty block of power at the very center of constitutional law and order? So that the whole idea of a constitutional future for African countries revolves around transparency, equality, and limitations to ensure equalities and rights. Is this something which is part of a process that is, let us say, bearing fruit in a manifold range of settings, certainly in one or two national settings, but as I said, you've got to have extra constitutional provisions, such as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, such as the Kachacha Courts, things to deal with this very special problems of violence that emerge in difficult times, transitional times, what to do about these instruments of transitional justice in terms of what is meant to be normally, if there is such a thing, normal constitutional justice. How do the two sit side by side? Similarly, how does traditional law sit alongside constitutional law? How does Sharia law for Islamic communities sit alongside constitutional law? particularly constitutional law that was meant to guarantee freedom of religion. So religious intolerance in some parts of certain countries, not just Islamic intolerance of unbelievers, but also fundamentalist Christian intolerance of others, such as Islamic believers. What to do about all of those in terms of a rule of law that derives from the constitution that all the same does not alienate members of the citizen group. In other words, when we talk about limitation of powers, it's not just the limitation of powers of presidents, but limitation of powers deep down.
how to solve these problems. Well, we haven't solved these problems in their entirety. We are asking these exact same questions in every single European region. We're asking these questions in the United States. These are questions which are part of an ongoing project of human history. So you have, as it were, something unfinished here. Does this also mean that the question of trauma is unfinished? Well, yes it is. When you look, for instance, at the so-called Democratic Republic of Congo, you're probably looking at an epicenter of unfinished and continuing ongoing trauma. One of the great underreported, sometimes entirely unreported wars in particularly the southeast of Democratic Republic of Congo, the retreating Hutu militias from genocide Rwanda. Uh, there's one player among many. Uh, the person who's mapped the different configurations of military organization, what we loosely call warlord organization, was in fact my SOAS colleague Zoe Marriage. Uh, Zoe is completely unable to recognize the condition of risk, and so as a lone woman, uh, she ventures into these warlord zones. And I think I've joked to some of you, uh, it's not a joke, she really has done this. Uh, when surrounded by men, child soldiers sometimes, pointing guns at her, she starts to sing. Uh, she's a trained opera singer. Uh, Apparently, her name is Zoe, and it's very resonant to one of the local words, Zoe, uh, which means a witch. Uh, and so they take her, these are Zoe's own words, so she, you've got to have jokes to laugh yourself away from the possibility of hidden trauma that arises from experiences of this sort. You know, are you going to be shot type of thing, and shot by a boy, you know, a very young one. And all of these questions are true. Uh, so she tells the story with a great relish that she's actually a witch, but she has been able to map the immensely complex configurations of warlord zones, warlord leaders, changing alliances and allegiances, different ways in which they've been from time to time bought off by the central Congolese government, the involvement of patrons in surrounding African states, the Ugandans for a time, for a time the Zimbabweans, even the Eritreans, the Angolans, even the Namibians, all of them have fought in the Democratic Republic of Congo with their armies. Emerson Minagagwa, the current president of Zimbabwe, was meant to have been witnessed by some of his own soldiers who afterwards deserted and sought political asylum in this country. I defended them in the courts in this country. I am very glad to say they got asylum, although it took quite a number of efforts to do that. What you had was everybody basically our turn to eat and somebody else's misfortune, in which all the same we found a reason to insert our army. So this kind of thing happens, which means that the idea of justice and trauma becomes multinational in Africa. Which of course asks the question, what is Africa doing about transnational justice? So it's the contradiction, as I said, about transitional justice extra constitutional means to deal with emergency situations that sit alongside, if not on top of, constitutional provision and constitutional means. So we want to find a place for transitional justice along with constitutional justice. What about transnational justice? What is the African Union doing about this? It's all well and good to complain about the International Criminal Court, although, as I said, in the case of Kenya in 2007, it was Kofi Annan who instigated the indictments against Kenyan politicians. What to do about the assumption of impunity? The problem, of course, with the International Criminal Court is that most of those who are indicted, not all of those who are indicted appear, most of those who are indicted to appear before the court and who do appear are African leaders, warlord leaders, no president as yet uh, has appeared before the ICC, although former President Bashir uh, was indicted. But this leads to an impression that it's a racist organization, that only Africans are brought before it, or are meant to be brought before it. Uh, 
there are two there's more answers to this so that is the ICC is in fact only one part uh, a minority part in fact of the international architecture of justice the UN special tribunals are very very key here and I'm referencing in particular the UN special tribunal for war crimes in former Yugoslavia also headquartered in Den Haag the Hague not far in fact from the International Criminal Court where Serbian, Kosovan, Croatian war criminals have been brought to answer for their war crimes and crimes against humanity. Presidents have appeared before that. President Milosevic of Serbia, for instance, he died in prison as a result of what happened in Den Haag at the Special Tribunal. Generals who were regarded as heroic, valorous liberators of stolen territory have been brought before the courts. General Kadovina from Croatia, when he was arraigned, to appear before the courts of his national mourning in Croatia because he was regarded as the liberator of territories seized from Croatia by Serbian militias. But he had committed war crimes in doing so. So the idea of answerability, of lack of impunity, is a difficult one. But far more white people have been brought before the international architecture of justice than black people. It's just a concentration in one part of the international architecture for justice of black people, and that is before the International Criminal Court. Can this kind of thing work, or is it now time for the African Union to establish an African Court of Justice for crimes against humanity, for crimes basically against the human rights of your own citizens, which should be constitutionally protected? Is it time for a court to deal with claimed impunity and immunity for exceeding the limits of constitutional presidential power and opposing far too many limits upon the human rights and the freedoms of the citizens. These are questions that we'll take up more next week. We talk about the future of Africa and how it can go forward. And of course, it begs a certain question, which again, I'll introduce in greater detail next week. It's one thing to bring people to justice. How do you end injustice in the first place? In other words, in terms of the African Union being able to intervene in conditions of violence, can it do this? Does it have the capacity to do this? Are we going to see constant reiterations of the French moving in overnight to deal with insurgencies in Mali, for instance? It even begs the question of how to reform African militaries because the whole idea is to modernize those militaries so they are in some ways equal to a Western military. But all the same, that's not how the insurgents fight. So re-equipping, retraining, or new forms of modern warfare, transnationally financed, how to deal with all of these is a challenge for Africa. While these challenges go unmet, what you've got is trauma. So I'll conclude by reiteration of the theme that I mentioned last week, but also at the beginning of this lecture, and that's trauma against women. You're looking at the Stone Virgins, where the traumatized veteran with his post-traumatic stress disorder sees that the only way he can survive as an entity of some sort, even a disordered entity, is by disfiguring mutilating, killing women, and killing them in the most ceremonial fashion. I think I've described to you the act of killing that's at the centerpiece of the novel, which takes place in the middle of a tango, using the stroke used to kill sheep in an abattoir, the same stroke used by Isis to kill their orange-clad prisoners who are kneeling in front of them for the world's voyeuristic cameras. Basically, what you have in this novel about the condition of women being traumatized 
by people with trauma. But all the same, the condition of women is repeated on a huge scale in jurisdictions. Well, if you can call them that, because there's very little oversight of this jurisdiction in terms of anything that's jurisprudential, of southeastern Congo. Our estimate is some 2 million fatalities. We don't have an estimate of what is being called gender side, that is the use of rape as an instrument of war. Certainly ISIS used it against particularly Yazidi women in the Middle East, in Iraq. Certainly it's a condition that has afflicted the victims of Boko Haram, but also by the soldiers sent to protect them from Boko Haram in Nigeria, as my PhD student found, and her fieldwork found very, very graphically. What is the condition of women in particular in the cross currents of trauma? Are they only the victims of trauma? <clears throat> my other PhD student, Georgina Holmes, found in her studies of the genocide in Rwanda that women were also participants of slaughter often against other women, of course, making all kinds of questions of contradiction and all kinds of warnings against trying to ascribe things only in gender-specific terms. But insofar as gender, in its specific terms, plays a huge role in terms of the future of Africa. Thomas Sankara famously said that women had to play a full part and had to be given the rights to play a full part in national development. How far off are we in accomplishing that in Africa? If women hold up half the sky, are they meant to do so without any heavy lifting equipment and facilitation? These are questions which will echo again as we round off the course next week. But what I've tried to do in today's lecture is to use people who are regarded almost as patron saints of mobilizing thought in Africa, people like Fanon, people like Biko, and saying that the questions that they raise lead on to vast questions of what it means to be a nation, what it means to be a state, what it means to be a citizen, what it means to seek to live underneath constitutionalized order, because without that, everyone is nothing. Everyone is no one. No legal identity, no legal personality, none. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.